want everybody to know I have stage fright, so I brought my friend here to help me through this trying next 10 minutes. Actually, this is a real, this is not plastic. My other one's plastic, so I won't bring it up. This is, this is a real human skull that came from India. And uh, they're very, very expensive. So if anybody would like to come see it, I'll let you touch it, but you can't take it home. My name's Dr. Rhett Murray, and I grew up here in Huntsville, Alabama. I went to Grissom High School, class of 79, Grissom, 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 hey. And then I attended the University of Alabama, Roll Tide. Roll Tide. Usually, I have to give talks to big groups of people who are stodgy doctors and nurses. So this is fun to be able to talk to young people. I get to wear my blue jeans rather than my white coat and suit and tie. I usually tell a joke that involves rocket scientists and brain surgeons at this point, but I think the, uh, the Rocket City rednecks have that all under their, under their belt, so no, no silly jokes. But I will tell you, people don't know what neurosurgeons do. I've had young people come up to me and say, Dr. Murray, can you make me smarter? Dr. Murray, can you make me stronger and more beautiful? And I say, no, I can't do that, but I can make it where you don't care. <laughs> We're going to talk today about, really, what it takes to be a neurosurgeon, but more importantly, what decisions you have to make if you decide to go into it. I, and I would encourage, whenever you get a chance to come to a talk like this where someone is speaking on a subject that, that they are passionate about and they've devoted their life to, you ought to... You ought to take that chance because uh, you don't get that every day. And what a be I can't think of a better way to spend a Sunday afternoon. I got to go to Aspen recently to uh, uh, something very similar called the Aspen Institute where we heard uh, experts in all fields, politics, uh, economics, and to, to see the looks on these folks' faces when they're describing the thing that they've worked on their whole life is, is memorable. I've been a neurosurgeon now or working to be a neurosurgeon or learning to be a neurosurgeon for 25 years and I'm still in the process of learning how to do it properly. So we're going to talk a little bit about what neurosurgeons do. See if this will work. This is the thing that we treat most often and we really wish we could do a better job with this is head injuries. I'm going to open up my friend here just for a second, excuse me. Ugh. He comes conveniently with a pop top. I wish people were like this. My, my surgeries would go a lot quicker. Can everybody see inside there at all? Inside your skull are all these hard ridges of bone. And some of them are quite sharp. And they're necessary for the nerves to get out of your head to your eyes and your ears and your tongue. But those sharp edges of bone are dangerous when you hit your head. When you hit your head, your skull bone, excuse me, I'm going to sit this down now, your skull bone stops, but your brain doesn't. It's floating in fluid, and it bounces around inside of your head. When it does that, it tears. Your brain has a consistency of cottage cheese. Anybody know what cottage cheese is? What happens if you stick your thumb in cottage cheese and pull your thumb out? There's a dent and a hole there, isn't it? Well, that's what happens to your brain when you injure it, when you hit it hard, and it's bruised. And when the brain is bruised, it swells. If I came up and punched that guy in the face right there, he'd get a big swollen shiner, wouldn't he? But all that swelling's on the outside. It looks bad, but it's not dangerous. But when you hit your brain and it swells, it's inside a closed box, and it didn't have anywhere to go. And that pressure can build up to the point where it chokes the blood supply out of your brain, and you pass on. So to become a neurosurgeon, you have to go through training to learn how to take care of these problems, and it's always evolving the best way to do this. You go to four years of college, and then you go to four years of medical school, and then you do what's called an internship. That's the year where you really learn how to be a doctor. And that's where all doctors do, to learn about the ins and outs of, of being a doctor. And I hope some of you in here would consider going into a career in medicine. When I became a neurosurgeon, there were 
4,200 neurosurgeons in the United States. Now there are 2,800 neurosurgeons in the United States. So the field is shrinking with the number of people that are doing it. There are many reasons for that. It takes a long time to, to get that diploma and that stamp of approval from the state of Alabama that says, yes, you can be a doctor. And it costs a lot of money. But the field is rewarding, and that's what I really wanted to talk to you all about today. It's, it's not only rewarding because you're doing what you're trained to do, but that you're always learning. I don't think there's any field in medicine quite like neurosurgery that has to follow the motto of medicine that is first do no harm. Anybody ever heard that? First do no harm? That's part of the, the oath that doctors take. And neurosurgeons quite often have to know when to stop. You get really proficient when you're in your training. After your intern year, you do a five-year residency where you really get in and learn how to operate. And when you get out of your residency, then you study for what's called the boards, and you become board certified. Even at that time, you're a proficient, but you're not an expert. Expertise requires even longer. And I wish I could say that I'm an expert right now. I won't, I won't brag in that way. I'd like for you all to consider reading a book by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers. And in it, he describes what it takes to be an expert in something. This goes to all fields, not just neurosurgery. He uses the Beatles, and he uses uh, Bill Gates as examples. That it, it's, an expert is not someone who was born that way, who is born, he or she born with everything they need to know to do, or all the talents they need to do their job as an expert. It takes 10,000 hours of practice to be an expert. And even after four years of college and four years of medical school and six years of residency, you're still not an expert. It takes time after that. And the expertise comes in knowing when to stop, knowing when to go all out with someone and knowing when to back off and say, no, the surgery is worse than the disease. I'm just going to give you some kind of boring statistics here. Y'all can read this. 80,000 people experience the onset of long-term disability every year. This is a big deal. 50,000 people die every year from injuries to their head. So we need more people interested in this field. Every 15 seconds, one person sustains a brain injury. So we've already been talking about that. There's been people hurt while I'm giving my speech. 90% of the people will have their cognition. That's their thinking. Affected. They won't be the same. There's a motto in neurosurgery, touch the brain, never the same. Any part of the brain that I touch, that I'm trying to heal from a tumor or from a blood clot, that part of the brain may never be the same after being manipulated. It's that sensitive. Vehicle crashes are the major cause of all the brain injuries. 50% of the time when I'm on call, it's because of a car wreck. Somebody usually doing something that they weren't supposed to do. And most of the time, it's on the weekends and at night. And that's why there used to be 4,200 neurosurgeons and now there's 2,800 neurosurgeons. Because that means you have to get up in the middle of the night or up from the Thanksgiving table and go see someone who's injured in the emergency room. I'm going to give you some wow slides. This is a little girl, eight years old, riding in a car, and she was... What does that say? When you don't wear your seatbelt and your car crashes, your car stops, but you don't. And you fly. And this little girl flew out the window of the car. And when she hit the ground, her body stopped, but her head didn't stop. Oh! And it popped her head off. Can everybody see right there? You see how that bone is no longer connected to that bone anymore? That ought to be sitting right there, just like that one is, and that one is, and that one is. Her head and that bone have been pulled apart off of her neck. And your spinal cord, which controls all the movements of your arms and legs and your breathing, runs right in that canal of the bone right there. Luckily for her, it was not torn in half, but it could very well have been. And this is one of those ethical dilemmas that you have to decide what to do. Let me give you a couple of cases. Let's say that this little girl was fine. She was moving everything. She was wide awake. 
would you want to fix this? Would that be something that needs fixing? Who thinks so? About everybody. Let's say this little girl was in a deep coma and her pupils didn't react to light and she couldn't breathe anymore and she was totally paralyzed and the odds are she was going to stay that way forever. Would that be something that you'd want to fix? Some people say yes. That's an ethical dilemma, isn't it? Well, luckily for this girl, she was not totally paralyzed. She had some weakness and she had to have this done. We took a bolt, a big metal rod, and pulled her bones back the way they're supposed to be, and then wired that into place, connected to her skull bone, and, and then took some of her bone and placed it around this so that this will become one big solid piece of bone and her head will be stable. Now, that means she's not going to be able to turn her head much anymore, but she's going to be able to walk and lead a pretty relatively normal life. So in her case, there, the there wasn't much ethical dilemma. But you can see how if the person the best you could hope for would be a bedridden existence without any quality of life. Would you want to go through such a big operation? This probably took six to eight hours to fix, and this little girl was probably in the hospital six months for this. That's just another picture of what we did to her, putting the screws in the... This is a picture taken during surgery. So, my mantra for the day, wear your seatbelt. Everybody agree to that? Yes, sir, Dr. Murray. This is a fellow who got in a fight when he was working in construction. I forget what the fight was. It's usually either over money or girls, one of those two. Some dude got mad and hit him in the head with a nail driving gun. Can anybody see that? This is called a CAT scan. It shows the inside of your head. It takes x-rays and takes slices of your brain like a tomato. This is the eye socket. There's an eyeball there, and this is the right side. Here's the eyeball here, and the nail went right next to his eyeball. Didn't hit it. Right through the socket that the eye goes, nerves goes in, and then right inside of his brain right there. But he was wide awake and talking and moving and not having really any trouble other than a nail sticking out of his head. <laughs> so what should we do? Should we just get a big hammer and go, and say, thank you very much, that'll be $25. Pay, pay as you leave. What else is inside your head besides your brain? There's only three things inside your head, really. Your brain, the spinal fluid that flows around the brain, and what feeds your brain? Yeah, blood vessels. And there's one called the carotid artery that lives right there. That's the hole where it comes inside your head. Look out, look at that. So what if I went, and all of a sudden this bright red stuff starts going, that would be bad, wouldn't it? So we did a test called an arteriogram. This is a test where dye is put inside the artery so we can see where it is better. And here's the dye coming up, and the carotid artery makes a couple little twists before it goes inside of your head, and look how close he was. So I'm taking this guy to Las Vegas with me. <laughs> He's got luck. So now that I know that that nail is not sticking in that artery, I can take it out without having to worry about him bleeding to death. And there's the nail. Pretty good size nail, too. <laughs> I should have given it to him as a necklace to wear. <laughs> These are some of the other things we treat. Neurosurgeons treat diseases of the central and peripheral nervous system. Y'all will learn all, I wasn't going to go into a lot of anatomy because you guys will learn all this when you take human fizz. Both of my sons there have taken it. They loved human fizz, didn't you? But we treat the diseases of the brain, spinal cord and nerves, and the surrounding structures. So we treat the spinal bones and the skulls and the blood vessels that feed the brain. Now, this is an example of a fracture. Everybody can see all, all these bones should look about the same as far as their size. Can everybody see this one? It looks like a marshmallow has been stepped on by Godzilla. So that bone is sticking back. This is the canal where the spinal cord runs. That bone is jabbing into the spinal cord and will cause more and more damage if not relieved. So we'll take that and come in. There's the fracture. Shows inside. This is a CAT scan showing the slice. The joints have split open, so this, these joints aren't really connected good anymore. 
we take that broken bone and we remove it. And then we take a piece of bone and put it back in the place where the bone used to be. And we put a plate in the good bone above and the good bone below and screw it all together. So that gets good and solid. And that doesn't help the damage that's done. There's not really much neurosurgeons can do for the initial damage other than prevention. That's why seat belts are important. That's why when you dive into a, a, a pond, how do you do it the first time? Feet first the first time, right? Broken foot is not like that. The damage that's done at the initial injury, there's not much we can do. Neurosurgeons' jobs are to prevent new injury, to prevent injury from the injury, such as swelling, such as bones crunching into the nerves, things like that. So that person's now better off because their spinal cord's much happier now. Another thing that neurosurgeons treat are aneurysms. Aneurysms are weak places on the blood vessels. Anybody ever seen an inner tube get a bubble on it or a balloon get a bubble on it before it would burst? Well, in your, ne in your head are arteries, and those arteries can form these little bubbles called aneurysms. There's one right there. Looks like a little raspberry when you look at it in real life. And here's that arteriogram again showing one right there. And those things have very weak walls. You don't know they're there until they burst. They're like little time bombs. And so you're fine until they pop. And when they pop, they can be deadly. Half the people just fall over dead. And you just find them dead at home. Of the half that make it to the hospital, half of those either die or have a bad stroke. So when you find these, you usually like to treat them. And the way we treat them are two. Either we do an operation and we put a little metal clip right across the neck so it can't bleed anymore, saving the blood vessel that feeds the brain. Or we come inside with a catheter and put coils on the inside of the artery. And again, we have to make decisions all the time as to whether or not we should do this. If this person had had a bleed, a hemorrhage, and they were very elderly and, let's say, in a nursing home and unable to care for themselves, and the best we could hope for is to get them back to about 75% of what they were, and that level was very low, it might not be in that patient's best interest to do that, to prolong suffering. It's not something doctors like to do. I look at it like a, a weightlifter. If you've got a man that can lift 500 pounds, and you take away 200 pounds of his weightlifting, well, he can still lift 300 pounds. But you have a guy that can only lift 210 pounds, and you take away 200 pounds of his weightlifting, then he can't do anything. And that's what you have to kind of judge, is how much potential for recovery a person's brain has. And that's a, that's a judgment call and an ethical call that we have to make all the time. Here's another fracture that we treat in much the same way. We put rods and screws in the back to hold them out, just a bigger set. So if anything I can leave you with, I, I want, would like you to consider going into medicine. Medicine's a great field. You learn things every day. Every year I have to take 40 more hours of school just to keep going. Thank you very much.